If as architects we understand culture of building, we'll understand the creation of value um, because those assets perform better for the developer in the first instance. Business of Architecture UK, episode 33. Hello and welcome Architect Nation. This is the podcast for architects where you'll discover tips, strategies and secrets for running an impactful and profitable design practice. Hello and welcome, Ryan Willard here, host of the Business of Architecture UK. And this week we have the second part of the live event that we had last month in October. So I think you're going to join where we left off last week in the middle of the panel discussion. So do enjoy. Now, before that, I wanted to let you know about a very special weekend that is designed specifically for practice owners, directors, and senior managers, architectural businesses who are looking for consistent growth in their businesses, or perhaps they don't have the kind of clients that they want. Maybe your credit control is not really in control. Maybe you're constantly being pushed down on price. I know what that can feel like. Uh, Maybe you're doing really unfulfilling work or maybe you're chasing projects that just never seem to materialize and just putting so much resource into doing that that it's becoming a difficult cycle to break out of. So this weekend is for you and it's not going to be an easy weekend. This is not going to be an academic style architectural conference where we listen to lectures and look at beautiful pictures of buildings, um, this is going to be a practical hands-on weekend where you will face the obstacles in your businesses with the expertise of Johan Taft. Um, And it will really leave you looking very differently at your practice um, after the weekend. And it might be one of these weekends where we need to book Monday morning off to kind of let all the ideas uh, percolate into our minds. But it's going to be a fantastic weekend. And if you're, it's booked out for the January 19th and 20th. Um, if you want more information, please email me at ryan, that's R-I-O-N, at businessofarchitectureco.uk. So I look forward to sending you more details on that. So enjoy this podcast. I think, to be fair, um, clients can be very difficult, <laughs> and they certainly, they're certainly not—they're certainly not angels. And uh, and so you, you know, you, I think you're—I think you're absolutely right that there, can, there must be moments when when you cut your losses, and you know, if 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 a client has asked you for the sixth version of the same scheme, and it actually looks remarkably like the first one, <laughs> you know, this this is not going anywhere. <clears throat> This, the, your, 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 that client is not taking your expertise or your ideas. So I think there's a kind of, there, that relationship is, you know, you have to be strong enough or, or mature enough to actually recognize that you, that, that the clients are, are good clients or bad clients mm. or medium clients and that, that actually you really want to try and grow your business around good clients mm. because that's where you will actually get their investment in the project. And I come back a little bit to the, to, to the point you made, which I think is absolutely right, is when I look at architects' work, I look at the, I'm looking for their handwriting. <laughs> and I know that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get uh, one architect to be the same ha- handwriting as another architect. And quite often when, you are, when you're being interviewed at the other side, you kind of say to yourself, am I, am I, is there a fit here? Is there a fit between the way I design, the way I think about things, and the way these people want it? And sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. Mm-hmm. And the most successful thing, so I can't, I can't change people's handwriting. And I say this when I'm advising anybody, even when I'm not doing it, is, yeah, it, do you like what, what your architect is doing? Because if you don't, why are they there? So this kind of notion that, that, that which you come in the public sector, which I find kind of bizarre, or in these bigger projects where there's a point scoring system, which is completely insane, uh, rather than simply saying, do you like the guy, that, you know, do you like the team that's in front of you? Do you feel that the schemes that they've done before are, are things that you like? It's Roger is so right, gut instinct. Architects, we just don't take on work if it doesn't feel right. And you know it really early days. I think yeah. most people know it, and it doesn't fit. 
Um, you know, we don't engage in the OG process at all. Um, and if a project's not right, we don't take it on. We'd rather not grow for that project. Absolutely. And that takes quite a lot of bravery in a current market. Mm. Um, there are a lot of rogue developers out there. Roger is not one of them, obviously. <laughs> but there are. And they will come into Architects' practices and they will ask for one spec scheme yeah. and another spec scheme. If you give somebody free work, it's just that. It doesn't have a value for somebody. Don't do it. Architects shouldn't. You know, it's, it's something that we really, really feel mm. very... If we've got a client, a long-established client, we've done three or four projects, and he comes in with a great site, of course we'll do a massing study for him. But there's that history there. But, you know, be mindful of developers. There are very good developers and, and funders, yeah. and there are those that, that, you know, are just a little bit more testy. And, and we've all had our experiences of them. You've obviously mm. had it as well. And they don't see value in architects or any of their advisors, whether that's the QSs or the structural engineers. And check them out. I mean, check the developers out. And, and there's two things, two questions you want to ask. Do you own that piece of land that you're asking me to build? Yeah. Or have you, got a, you know, have you got a contract on it? And, and if the answer is no, well, well then, am, am I being paid to... You, what you're... What, you as the architect, if the, if the developer doesn't have a hold on that, you're speculating your time and effort to help him make his pitch, or her to make his her pitch. And so I think that's really, I think you have to be much more, you, you know, that information is all, all out there. And actually, you just have to be more careful and cautious, because what we're saying is, what is the things that can disrupt? Now, what can disrupt you terribly is if that, if that developer is underfunded or, or really hasn't, is flying a kite, He's flying a kite on the basis of your, the stuff that you're doing for him. And I think that's, that can be, that's very dangerous because you don't know whether he's going to actually be able to land that kite. And um, I think for the same reason, the open competition process, I mean, RBA support them. Dreadful. PQQs that ask for design feasibility work it's when you've never even met them. Yeah. It's, it's bullshit. It costs a firm like us like eight grand to do something like that. And I could spend all year doing them and get nothing because I'm not the right person. That was a cheer. <coughs> and I just think that it's exactly the same. Like if a developer comes to me asking for a feasibility appraisal, why would I not charge for it? It's the same for an open competition process. Fine if you've just started and you just want something to get your teeth into to get something on your website, but that's it. We never do them again because... And I think that the RBA have a lot to answer for in terms of running competitions yeah. like that. And I think that we should all avoid them as a group. Like the whole industry should avoid things like that, where we're paying to give somebody else the visuals to support their funding process. I think it's terrible, and um, I won't go on anymore, but that can kill your profit. And it's so few people win work from it. It's crazy. Why, why are we doing it? I just think it's, I think we should collectively not do any more. Yeah. And well, we, we, yeah. we know why we're doing it collectively yeah. as a profession, because we're still obsessed by cost and not value. Yeah. Yeah. And therefore, while we continue to, so, you know, everybody's saying, oh, well, you know, 14 firms can apply for this competition and receive no fee. Mm. My, meanwhile, 14 teams have done 14 mm. times the work. Mm. For what benefit? For what value? Mm. How does that add anything to either, mm. to anybody? No, I think, I, and I think it's irresponsible of the RIBA to run competitions when they haven't done financial checks mm. on the team that's actually putting the scheme together that they know, one, that they own it, two, they've got the funding, and three, they've got the um, technical record. And we can't, these days, developers can't proceed, they won't get funded they won't get an institution to back them, they won't get funding, whatever it is, unless they've actually got the track record to prove that they can do it. We don't, it, it, the developers sit, we're like kind of, I always like to say ourselves, we're like jockeys that sit on the back of a horse in a race. And you know, if I'm, if I'm making money, then lots of people want to stick pound notes on my back. If I've hit a bad patch, it's all on somebody else's. So the whole thing is about, how well we can actually create the magic. Because developers have to do this strange magic risk thing and they take it and they run with it and they spend all the money out and then there's suddenly this big sack of cash comes in at the end. But, you know, that's when you win the race. If you don't win the race, you spend a lot of time out there talking to your mates. <laughs> um, yeah, from, yeah, from a psychology, psychological perspective, you talk about developers, you look at a very, very different animal, a developer and an architect. These are almost opposing beasts. One is uh, very precise, very uh, meticulous, 
uh, wants to be nice to people. The other one is a gambler. He's a tiger. No, 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 yeah. we're not gamblers. We're, Some we're of them risk. are. A lot of them that I have worked we're with risk, are gamblers. We're risk, risk takers. Okay. And that we're kind of, that we're just Correct. be careful. Risk takers, yeah. On the edge yeah, of being gamblers. Takers, yeah. Yeah. But and it's um, very thrilling, kid. It is, it is. <laughs> it certainly is, yes. It certainly is. But these are very, very different animals. And, and, and these two people coming to work together, they take something. And um, I, I know a lot of, a lot of architects uh, will perhaps take on stuff they shouldn't be taking on. Uh, not that they don't know that they shouldn't be taking it on, but because their pipeline is running pretty thin and they feel their, their, back, up, their back is up against the wall. They don't feel they have a lot of options. So um, earlier on we talked about turnover. I mean, profit is everything. Turnover is, um, what do they say? Turnover vanity. is vanity. vanity. Yeah. Profit is sanity. Yeah. But without turnover, there is no profit. And you want good turnover. <laughs> And you want plenty, plenty of customers coming through the door, an abundance of customers coming through yeah. the door. So every business owner, every, every, every leader in, in, in any business, architect or other, should first and foremost be a good salesperson. They should understand the psychology of selling. You're going to be selling your business not only to clients, but to talent. That's what you deal with. Mm -hmm. you know, you're selling your business and the proposition and the career to your talent. You're selling it to your family who support you when you're burning the midnight oil if you have to do that. You're selling to everybody. If you don't have good selling skills and don't understand the psychology of selling and the psychology of buyers, buyers don't care about you. Buyers buy for their reasons, not for yours. And if you don't understand that and you do not understand um, what you need to be doing to protect your offering, to protect your business from that psychology, you are going to find yourself in some pretty hot water. And it doesn't, it's not that hard to do. Um, but I do know, for instance, from speaking to Ryan, certainly, that the REBA didn't teach you much about that, did it? No. Unfortunately, and uh, they should. And school, high school, didn't teach us about that. And university, for most of us, didn't teach us about that. But yet, 80% of everything we do is interaction with other human beings. And uh, decisions are made with other human beings. And if we do not understand how that psychology works, I think we're missing out on, on, on a massive opportunity um, to, to get things right. And it's just, and so one word everyone needs to learn uh, to say after me, no. <laughs> <laughs> just say no. Yeah. And you can always say yes. But we say yes because we're afraid of, you know, not closing any deals this month and I need to pay this one, I need to pay that one. So we start shrinking our power, shrinking our self-esteem and uh, shrinking our opportunities and possibility. And we then take on people we don't really want to work on with, people we don't want to work with. Um, projects that really don't represent the dream we had when we first started. They don't particularly represent the brand we're putting out. We've paid some expensive marketing agency to put out, to create the brand and put out, but we're actually taking on clients that don't really fit with that. So the impact is huge. And then they don't pay on time. And then they pushed us for a discount. And then we gave them some free consulting right up front. And it goes on and on and on. Paul Williams of um, Stanton Williams 19 years ago told me that uh, as a lovely piece of advice, no client is better than a bad client, and I still remember that Absolutely. to this day. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Yeah, no client is better than a bad client, very good. So, I'm quite keen actually to get some questions from the audience now. We've got the roaming mics. Mm. Has anybody got any questions? Lanray, just wait for the, the mic will come around. This gentleman here, put your hand up. Hi, uh, Lanry Bellardi. Just a quick question. Um, thank you very much all for your kind of contribution so far. Somebody touched upon the idea of uh, the architecture kind of profession being quite crowded or the market being quite crowded. I think it might have been yourself, Joe. Um, simple question, is the industry actually too fat? Does it need kind of, you know, leaning up a little bit more? Um, it's a difficult one to say. I mean, you know, the reason that the industry is crowded at the moment is because land values haven't ratified um, at a purchase point against resale values, quite simply. So less and less has become viable to develop. We've got a looming Brexit, change of government, you know, difficult time economically. Mm -hmm. So two years ago, there weren't enough architects. There was so much work going around, you know, nobody was competing, no one was dropping their fees. I think that the market feels crowded at the moment as much due to the economics. Um, of the kind of current environment which the UK is in. Um, so I think 
is it crowded? Yes, it is. I think it's about streamlining and being more clever. Um, I think what's been amazing to watch, really, in the last few years is the rise of people who come straight out of university and start their own businesses. Um, and that's been a real change, actually. Um, you know, most people would do what I did and go and spend eight or nine years and work in a sort of practice and learn what you could. Um, and I think that's interesting. And I really like it, the solopreneur architect. Um, I think it's going to target that niche market. I think it challenges. When we talk about free work, we do do it, um, but it's for ourselves. You know, we're always doing R&D in different projects, you know, the future of family housing, you know, as opposed to the Barrett housing estate, or, or you know, we're looking at different types of modular and high-rise, and we're pushing our business to think all the time about the next step. The future of workspace is a big focus for us in R&D at the moment. Beyond the critical walls and the bean bags of a WeWork, what is the future of workspace? You know, what does Bitcoin mean? What does blockchain mean? How do people work? How do they live? So I think it is a crowded market, but I think that if you are, if you have initiative, if you're looking culturally at what's happening, if you're looking at economically what's happening ahead of you, I think practices, the best practices will survive. Anyone else want to? Add anything to that? I was just going to say that uh, so few buildings in the UK actually have any involvement from architects, uh, which we all know. And maybe that comes down to the point we were talking about, about architects not um, linking themselves with the value they create. And I think that there's, in a way, in order to spread the market thinner, if we all understood how we could add value to people who aren't even considering using architects, and maybe to s find a way of demonstrating that our costs would increase their value beyond what the process they might otherwise yeah. take with a surveyor or whatever. Um, I think that could help sort of even it out. But yeah, it does feel like a crowded market with lots of people ambitious to do um, similar things. And uh, I know that my parents are architects and they, they, sometimes I ask them advice and they're like, oh, just who, it was who you knew. There was no PQQ, there was no procurement process. It was a totally different industry. And as we've all got uh, the, the the, the kind of atmosphere is different and the way that you get projects is different. We're all f fighting over kind of similar things. And it goes back to my point about trying to become an expert, trying to be the only person for the project. Yeah, it's quite, it's, I find it quite interesting talking to lots of architects. Um, I was speaking to, I think it was Ben Allen recently. He was saying his generation, people when they would wait till they were like in their 40s, 50s, having had 10 years of experience working in architects. Now it's much more common for people almost straight out of university to setting up their own practices, which has kind of totally changed the sort of demographic of architects that are there, and there's a lot more of us. Well, it's good. It's good start. I, start, I, I started a practice when I was in my 20s, and uh, 30 years later, we had some, we've had some buildings listed, so that, you know, <laughs> there's an advantage there. I, I, think, I, think it's, I think what's interesting is that I think there's too much corporate architecture. The, the, the corporate architecture is one field, and the, and the problem with corporate architecture is it demands of you as an architect to have a, a corporate response. And I think a corporate response is a very expensive, and it means you have to have a very big office with a very big overhead. And I think that actually the, the, there's much more demand for the character, for the personal, for the artisan, nature of the way architecture is the only profession that comes up with uh, a new idea for any piece of land anywhere. And so in, in, in what, what we do, which is where we chase gap sites and we look at gap sites because those are the opportunities we find in the city and that's, those are the, in a way, where, where I think we have as a society responsibility to go on filling those for housing. The architect's vision actually how you construct a building in that gap site is something which is unparalleled. There's no other profession. A surveyor can't do it, an estate agent can't do it, a quantity surveyor can't do it, an engineer can't do it, an architect can. And I don't think it's very odd that we don't kind of play on that strength. Uh, and, and I think that maybe if the, if the market, I completely agree, I think the market at the moment is going through a very difficult period. Um, the, the land prices are overinflated. They're going to fall. Uh, you've got you've got you've got a condition in a development appraisal which is very very tricky because you've got building costs going up because of uh, effects of Brexit and tariffs that are coming on. You've got labour shortages which are again part of the Brexit. You've got building costs, uh, building values, uh, end values, uh, residential sales which are falling. 
and you've got land stuck there which is not falling with it. And so as a developer, you're, you're, uh, you know, you're, you're in a very, very difficult position because most developers really succeed because the, 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 the values rise with them and so they absorb some of the rising costs because you can't know every cost. So kind of in a, in a way, it's a very exciting moment because actually what it means is the old tried and tested methods the guys that are going out there and sticking up more and more residential blocks with their amount of their affordable housing and the standard old stuff isn't is is that formula's gone and that formula ain't going to carry on and i don't think it's going to come back so you now got in a fresh territory which is now you can invent the position that you find yourself and you can you can now tell your own narrative and that we haven't talked about that much today but it, we're coming on to it because it, to me it's the secret that actually you have to, your, your notion of your marketing is how you find your narrative of what you're proposing to your client and that's how your client buys into you. And in that same article that I showed from the FT, oh, we don't need to show it again, okay. but, but <laughs> in, in that same article, in another place, there was this story um, about uh, uh, this client who was a billionaire he had this architect, he was telling to the guy writing it, he said, you know, I just, I couldn't, I, the guy's fees were so astronomical, I'm never ever gonna use him ever again. And they said, well, we can find somebody else. And the next conversation he had with him, he said, well, I actually flew him in, because I couldn't do without him. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I think a crowded, a crowded market uh, is, it, it forces people to get good or get out eventually. And I, I tell business people, assume the market is always crowded. In other words, be excellent all the time. Be good at selling, be good at innovation, be good at leadership, be good at management, be good at finance, um, be good at hiring, be good at firing, be very good at training all the time. Now, Henry Ford said it's better to train people and uh, lose them than not train them and keep them. <laughs> It's that kind of mentality. You want to be at the top of your game all the time. And when the marketplace is abundant, or the opposite of overcrowded, uh, people get complacent. It's easy. And suddenly when it gets tough, they don't have the systems in place, they don't have the pipeline activity in place, etc. They don't have a proposition which is better than, or unique, exactly what you're talking about. You're finding your unique proposition, um, which totally represents you, you're proud of, and, and the marketplace is excited by it. Um, when things are easy, we get complacent. And complacency is the uh, first step to slow death, basically. Right, any more questions? Yes, gentlemen with the glasses. Hi. Um, seems to be a bit of the buzzword um, of the evening, value. So about that, um, it's quite hard to quantify sometimes what value an architect can bring, because there's, there's the talk about numbers of units, GIA, GEA, et cetera, but the, the nature of the profession is it's a little bit more complex in terms of it being a, an art and a business. So how can we distinguish the two, and how can we actually quantify the design aspect of architects delivering more quality and that, make, that making um, almost your unique selling point. You, I, I, since I've been going on about value, uh, I think what's, what's, what's fascinating about value is it is it is a you know it is a, it, 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 it's a kind of field of examination in its own right. To me, value is about the appropriateness of the buildings you're making. It can be a value to a community. It can be a value. You can you can have a I can have a wonderful moment in a building that we've made because that light coming in from that window hits the table that I'm working on and makes me feel magnificent. That's value. I've had, you know, the architect has added value. Don't, it's not all about the bottom line. It's all about a kind of, actually, it's just a recognition that you do not exist. Nobody owes you a penny. Nobody's going to pay for your fees unless you're adding something to the story. And I think we add enormously to the story because we have imagination. I run a development company and basically I employ architects doing all kinds of things that architects shouldn't do. Like I have land buyers who are architects. 
And the reason I have land buyers who are architects is because they use their eyes yeah. in an architectural way to recognize those bits of the city which are going to excite me. They're adding value to my story. They're different to a land buyer that, that works for a, a house builder. You know, I have project managers who are architects. Why? Because they can actually understand that it, when we're actually developing that and we're having a discussion around a design team meeting, the value that we want to create as a, as a company that we know our customers want from us is something that actually we're going to do. So somehow, I think it's somewhat outrageous that for the years of study that you spent at school that you paid so much money for, that actually value was not engaged, since actually that is the tr that's our trade, that's our stock, that's our currency. When you stand in front of a client, you've got, you're, you're, you're kind of, you know, you're seducing them into what? Into a vision of something which is different, which is a vision of value. It might be a vision, you look at, look at the Maggie Centers and look what an extraordinary um, uh, whole process of patronage the Maggie Centres has been. And look at the value that those Maggie Centres have added. Not financially, because they're not financial buildings, but look at the value they've added to the single person that's dying of cancer that's actually spent whatever it is, the month or the weeks, in that and had, has, have been uplifted by the architecture you've presented. Yeah. There's your value. The, you know, it, yeah. it's, it, 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 it's, it's an intangible and tangible Yes. But it is a, what I'm saying, it's a currency that we should understand, it's a currency that we should have, and it's a currency that we should put on the table. The, the interesting thing about value, I think, certainly my observation over the years, is that the tangible value actually is more expensive. People well, will pay more for intangible value. Yeah, well, there's so an, that there's, feeling they get with the light on yeah, the table, absolutely. they'll pay for that. They don't care about, they do to a degree, but they'll pay silly money for a, for a hole in the wall in the light. It's just a hole in the wall in the light. But it just brought some magic, and they'll pay for that magic. Back in the 70s, um, Harley Davidson's sales were crashing because the Japanese companies were starting to make motorcycles, but they weren't selling motorcycles. Harley Davidson was selling motorcycles. They were selling, uh, and all their advertising was around 1,400 cc of thumping pistons and uh, you know, chrome and pictures of engines and... Uh, Honda were selling a dream. They even call their motorcycles Super Dream. And their advertising was uh, a couple on a motorcycle in this beautiful countryside and the hair waving underneath a helmet in the wind. And that's what they were selling. And they took the market by storm. Uh, 25 years later, Harley Davidson, were on the brink of bankruptcy, brought in some very, very expensive consultants. The consultants knew uh, it was, th they knew how much pain um, and, and, and the cost of these mistakes to um, Harley Davidson, so they charged them appropriate fees, value, to turn the thing around, okay? And uh, it was, a lot of it was intangible because the stuff they taught them wasn't pistons, it wasn't nuts or bolts. It was, you need to sell a dream. Now, Harley Davidson are very successful today. And what are they selling? A dream, a lifestyle, yeah? <laughs> Tattoos, <laughs> uh, T-shirts, leather jackets. They weren't selling that in the 70s. Can I give a really practical example? Because I think I'm, we're also really com always coming across the question about added value. And like, we're working on a housing project for Community Land Trust, so the budget is tiny, and we're trying to put a lot, trying to spend some money on landscaping and public space. This is of no value. The house prices are already set. They're set. They were set when we started the project like a year ago. They're not going anywhere, but costs are rising. So we have this really fundamental problem on this project that the longer it takes, uh, the more tricky it is. But basically, where we are working on housing projects like that, we're coming to the point where we're talking to people who are managing the buildings in the future and asking them what, the, what is of really great value to them on these houses. And it's, uh, we had a really interesting answer the other day, which was, I want my people living there to have a really good night's sleep because they're all working long shifts, they're having a really difficult time. So then the design value that we can bring is for our residents to have a really, really good sleep. So a really great place to live with a quiet public space. So we sort of change the public space design slightly to be less sort of boisterous and play space. Because actually, I thought what they said was so sensible. Other things about maintenance, etc. But I think that where you want to demonstrate value, you have to ask your client what the value is to them because you might get some surprising answers. And it's not always for us to say, oh, it's really important to spend money in this area or that. Mm. You've got to find out to them in the same way that you talked about the Maggie Center, you know, the value there is not a tangible thing as such. Yeah, I think you've got to tease yeah. it out of them and yeah. present it to them as well because the problem 
the, 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 uh, the client brings is never the real problem. Mm. It's, uh, there's always something behind it, and there's always something they're not looking at. You know, they don't have your eyes. An architect has incredible eyes. I mean, I do a lot of different things with Ryan, and I bring him into all sorts of different things because he has those architect eyes. He sees stuff in a way that I don't <laughs> see it. It's priceless. It really is priceless. Um, and clients don't see that. But if you're not taking them on a journey, and that I would call, that's all the conversations that should happen before anything gets built, before any drawings happen. These conversations, this, this discovery, uh, this journey should be, should, should be happening between you and the prospect and painting a picture of what is possible, touch moving them and inspiring them with what architecture could bring to these bricks and mortar at the end of the day. And, and, and that's, I think, where, where, that's what I love about your profession. But that's the missed opportunity often. Value is an interesting one. Um, you know, we're, we're an architecture practice that understands it fiercely. But one of the things that we talk about a lot in our office um, is the culture of buildings. Um, as you say, bricks and mortar. And we use an example of the Ace Hotel in Shoreditch. You know, that was, I think it was an intercontinental three years ago. You know, it's at 50% occupancy levels, 150 pounds a night. You know, EPR Architects did a great job, not plugging them, but you know, they did a very good job with Universal Design Studio and they spent 120 pounds a square foot on that building. They put a new office, you know, sort of, you know, communal workspace at the ground, they put a restaurant in, they put some flowers outside, they put some bulbs up. You know, they redecked the roof and, and they fitted out the bedrooms and they did a great branding and marketing campaign. The same bricks and mortar rents for 300 pounds a night, so it's a 90% occupancy level. That is a cultural change in a building. Absolutely. The value we create is about the culture of buildings, whether it's your housing estate and that public realm and the urban realm, the way people interact, you know, whether it's an office building, the way people work together. If you can make assets perform, you know, people want to be there, they want to use them, particularly as we move into built to rent. And built to rent for me is hotels, it's, it's offices, it's flats, it's housing. You know, the market will move into stuff we build to rent out you know, as equity depletes and next, you know, even further now coming. So if as architects we understand culture of building, we'll understand the creation of value um, because those assets perform better for the developer in the first instance. And whether that's a droplet of light on a table or you know, whether that's a Maggie Center, um, I think if you can focus on that but also understanding the benefit of it um, and actually how you viably deliver that, that, that for us is what value is. Brilliant, thank you very much. Time for one more question. Linden. Yes. Um, just wait for the microphone. Thank you. Um, at what stage then would you introduce cost planning, say, any of you architects? Because, you know, Roger, you've probably got people on your team that produce you costs um, of the development. But in Joe's case, you've got clients coming to you, they ask for a building. And you've got to tell them, presumably, how much it's going to cost them. And you could use a square foot rate, as you said. But at what stage would you, you know, involve quantity surveyors and cost planners? And or would you do it, or would you rely on the architect to sort of like appoint his own QS and say, right, your building is going to cost this much, and we're happy? Or would you, would you come? I mean, do you think there's more strength in you going to the uh, client and saying, well, we, we've, you know, got our own cost planners or consulted, and this is what we're pretty much sure it's going to be? I mean, um, okay, I'll answer this one. Um, look, if. We work in a very specific part of the market, so we do sort of bigger buildings, multi-units, and um, we do actually do single houses, family houses as well. It's quite an interesting mix. But um, when we're sitting on day one, most of our most of our sites are unconsented, so most of our work is on planning risk. And generally, we're working for developer looking at a site, and, and we've got an amazing new office building going up um, in Wandsworth. And when we sat on that, we were developing the brief: would it be residential or would it be workspace? And we were a big part of that from a planning point of view. But we're also understanding, you know, in that area, you know, how much should something cost? You know, how much can you do it for? So we have close relationships with lots of QSs um, and other architects, and, and we actually just pick up the phone and say, you know, you guys are working at, you know, I think of Fenfield and Cliff Bagley, they are working cross. Guys, what are you delivering this for? Is it 275, 285 a square foot? So we start to sort of ratify roughly where we are. Um, but there's not a great deal of point bringing in cost consultants to cost up a scheme until you've actually kind of run that generically through testing with the client, also with a planning hat on. So, but yes, we work from, with a costing point from, from early doors and certainly understand the lower and upper limit of what we're gonna be able to spend to actually get it delivered. I just agree with, sorry, with Joe. We, uh, on the other end of the scale, working on a community centre in the Cotswolds, and uh, on that project, I think their brief is unviable. 
So although they've asked me to quote for plans, etc., I said, I'm not going to because you can't, it doesn't work. I'd love to do it, but it doesn't stack up and it's not sort of morally right for me to waste your money on doing it. So I've got a, I spoke to a local QS and who kindly offered a quick area, um, meter square area. And then I'm, we're going to have a kind of fundamental viability discussion, talk about it on basic principles. I quite like to keep the QS out of the meeting room until we have a shared vision so that it doesn't get watered down, to be honest, and doesn't get run by the QS. I do find often that um, QSs are really experienced and kind of can slightly bulldoze the process. I know you're a QS. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but I. I think you just have to check in at appropriate scale at every stage. Definitely don't ignore the the QS's input early on because otherwise you're going to go for planning with a scheme that you can't build, but um, just the right scale at the right time, I think. Well, for, for, from a development perspective, um, um, we, we, we're, we're running development appraisals from the first moment that we're looking at a site. But we're not running a development appraisal then forgetting about it. It's a, for, for us, it's a health check. I mean, you know, you don't quite run them daily, but, but you, know, you do run them continuously and continuously through all stages. And I suppose that what I feel is that the, the, my, my criticism of, of, of QSs is that I don't think we're nearly creative enough in the process of making buildings. Now, it's quite interesting because uh, different architects in different parts of the world actually control costs. So uh, uh, Swiss and German architects do prepare bills, uh, uh, costs in their, in their office. And I was recently working uh, with an architect which, who had a Swiss office in, on a project in London. And um, when we got the, the uh, working drawings, we went, went out to tender. I said, uh, Jean-Paul, do me a favor. I said, would you send this back to the Zurich office and ask them to price the same project? And the difference between the price that came out of the Zurich office and the price that we bought that work for in London was 40%. So Switzerland was 40% cheaper wow. than London, wow. which is, in a way, surreal. <laughs> but, you're, but, you're, but effectively, the quantities of theirs and, uh, uh, kind of compound and say, oh, well, we've done a comparable exercise. And it's a really, really tough job to break through that. And I think we really, the government is saying it, that we have to find, we have to, we have to radically change costs, that we need to be taking a third of our of the cost price. And we don't create that third through your value engineering, because value engineering is cost cutting by another name. But what I'm interested in is obviously making value at the other side. And we now know we've been doing it for long enough, and we have our customers, whether our, whether our customers are our investors, who are buying our completed building, or our customers are our tenants who are renting the office space, or, or our customers are buying our, our residential space, we can now charge a premium, and everybody recognizes that the quality of the buildings we make is what they're buying into. And that gives us an edge in the marketplace, because when our buildings are out in the marketplace, we get a queue of people that want to buy them, and our competition doesn't. And we only get that queue of people, not because they like the color of my face, it, only because the quality of that building and the way our teams and our architects have actually delivered that quality is, is what we get our premium for. And we have to start to think in those ways, and we have to think of an entirely, there, there's far too much risk covering in the whole of the construction cost side. And that is really doing, it's a kind of, it's a nonsense. It's the notion that somehow development is a risk-free business. It isn't. Development is, un is undertaken by a, a very uh, skilled set of professionals who should know their business. There's, there's no place to park that risk on a, on a contractor who, is, who actually is not nearly as capable of taking that risk as the developer is. There's a, there's a complete misunderstanding. And we just have to kind of work that through. Thank you. We're going to end it there. But thank you so much. So that is a wrap. Thank you for listening. 
The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.